This morning in 1 Samuel, you might say we have, oh, what do you call it, a real David and Goliath situation, you might say. What do you think? Do you think it's kind of a David and Goliath situation? Have you heard that expression before? Did you know it got kind of coined about 3,000 years ago? And the original David and Goliath situation takes place in 1 Samuel 17. So have any of you seen or have an example of a David and Goliath situation? Have you ever been in a David and Goliath situation? What is a David and Goliath situation anyway? What would you throw out there if you're in a David and Goliath situation? I mean, it's kind of funny. Last night, 8.30 p.m., Jeff comes and finds me in the house, and he's like, oh, you won't believe this. So there's the FIFA Women's World Cup going on, and they're getting ready for the big game between the Netherlands and South Africa, and guess what the sports commentator said? You might say it's a real... It's a real David and Goliath situation. So, yeah, so what's going on there? What's a David and Goliath situation, in a nutshell? Two opposing sides that are not equal. So, yeah, yeah, well, in this, right, right, right. We'll see what happens, right? Right. So, yeah, and I'm not sure I didn't see the end of Netherlands versus South Africa. What's that? Two nil? The Netherlands won. So I think we call things David and Goliath situations because it's not always, you know, the ending that happens in the original David and Goliath situation. So what happened in that original David and Goliath situation? So it starts on the battlefront. So we've been reading 1 Samuel across the summer, and the Israelites under King Saul are occasionally in this book at battle with the Philistines, those evil Philistines. And in this chapter, the Philistines have a very, very powerful fighter named Goliath. And Goliath, it was so funny at Bible studies this week um, to have, here you try to calculate, well, how tall was Goliath? How tall was he? So we'll just ballpark it. You know, nearly seven feet, nine feet, he was a giant. I was going to tell a little joke, and his name was Bud Crawford, um, Omaha, Omaha hero who just uh, got a world championship um, fighting. Um, he's coming. When is the parade? Saturday for him? Bud Crawford. But you know what? Goliath was no welterweight. Bud Crawford's like, what, 147 pounds? And Goliath was hundreds and hundreds of pounds in fighting uh, mass. So he was big, he was heavy, and he was armed from head to toe. And he was mouthy. He uh, taunted Israel. Someone want to come out and fight me? I'll take one. Take, give me your best fighter. I, I want to go mano a mano with one of you people. And Israel's response was, take a look, verse 11, and again in verse 24, they fled. They were so scared. Meanwhile, back in Bethlehem, so last week, it was July, and we were in Bethlehem. Hmm. So we were in Bethlehem, and it wasn't Mary, Joseph, and the baby. It was Jesse and Jesse's eight children. It turns out Jesse's three oldest children had been shipped out to the battlefront. And Jesse, the dad, kept sending provisions to them and their commander. And so Jesse used this other kid, the youngest, number eight, who was a sheep person. He'd send that kid out to send some bread and cheese, um, help support the troops. What was that youngest kid's name again? David. 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 
So David came to the battlefront in order to make a delivery. And while David is here, it's, you know, it's 40 days in to this taunting, crazy thing with Goliath. David overhears Goliath and Goliath's taunts, and David is indignant. How is this going on? This is nuts. So David keeps asking around, what's going on? Why isn't someone taking care of this? On and on. And as David does that, David's oldest brother, Eliab, overhears and said, what are you doing here, pipsqueak? Why are you here, you irresponsible, rubbernecking, good-for-nothing little kid? Why are you here at the battlefront? David keeps going. He keeps asking questions. What's up? What's going on here? And then David's questions and trying to sort out what's going on, those questions reach King Saul. So David gets an audience with King Saul. And King Saul says to David, look, kid, if you think you can fight that giant, you're out of your mind. You're a kid, and this guy is a seasoned fighting professional. He's a warrior. And David says, I'm a warrior in my own way. When I was a shepherd, I had to deal with lions and bears with my bare hands. I can hack this. Maybe King Saul was just desperate enough. He says, okay, I'll send you into battle. And then King Saul proceeds to put his own, Saul's armament, on David head to foot. And what happens? David can't move. It's too big. He's a kid. So David strips off Saul's armament, grabs his own shepherd's staff, gets five smooth stones from the waterbed, and heads out with his slingshot. And the rest is history. How many slingshots did it take? On the story, one. One rock hits the giant, he is felled. And the Bible underscores, like, several times. Did David use a sword? Nope. David did not use a sword. When we hear this story, or when we hear of David and Goliath situations, I think we can't help but insert ourselves into those situations and imagine What's that like? And many of us have faced David and Goliath odds in our lives. And maybe we think about, you know, how would I do this? How do I get through this? What's our strategy? So let's take a look at the story again, thinking, how did David get through this? Because I'd observe that before David even reached the fighting line with Goliath, he had 40 verses of adversity to get through first. First of all, David made it to the battlefront. And at the battlefront, David saw and heard Goliath's taunts. And David's reaction was indignation. This is ridiculous. In contrast to the rest of the Israelites who were fleeing in fear. David could have got sucked into the fear wave, but he did not. He remained calm, and he kept asking questions about the situation. What's going on here? What's going on here? So David overcame that hurdle. Next, Eliab, his older brother. Man, this would have set me back. If a member of my family or someone who was kind of my boss, questioned my motives of what I was doing there, what I was asking about, and saying that I was irresponsible, and that I was just messing things up, and I had no right to be there, calling me maybe self-centered for even trying to think through this, that might have put me off and said, oh gosh, maybe I don't belong here. Who am I to ask questions about this situation? And then when David met with King Saul, Saul says, you're a kid. 
this guy is a professional warrior. Game over. Wow. The fact that David can make a comeback like, well, here's my resume. My resume is good enough in this situation. Then Saul projected onto David, well, then, if you're going to do it, you're going to need my armor, my way, my protection. And the nerve that David's like, you know, I'll try it, but it's not going to work. And David goes back to what he knows, his shepherd, modest lifestyle. Shepherd's crook, and then he uses what's right in front of him. There's some rocks there, I'll use that. And then his trusty slingshot, and he gets the job done. Wow. When I analyzed this text, it reminded me of something I've been thinking about for a couple of weeks anyway. And I call it the three trusts, the three trusts. And these three forms of trust, you could talk about them in any particular order. But the first one I'll roll out today is self-trust. A lot of times in the Bible, when it talks about self-trust, it sounds like a bad thing. Someone is trusting in themselves and not trusting in God. So sometimes self-trust can come across as ego. It's all about me, me centered. In this case, self-trust, well, let's call it healthy self-trust. In family systems theory, there's a term called self-differentiation, which is very hard to define. And I thought maybe this is a time where we can use that term of self-differentiation. When David goes out to the battle line, I think a typical normal human reaction is, everybody's afraid, I'm afraid too, let's clump together and be afraid. And just be um, this big mass of nervous, anxious energy and safety and let's being afraid. But David was self-differentiated. He had a healthy sense of trust in himself, that he didn't have to glom on to everybody else's emotions about a situation. He wasn't a sheep. When others were like, ooh, uh, we watch out for Goliath, bah, bah. David's like, ugh, come on. You know, we are not seventh graders trying to look up to some eighth grade bully and imitate him. No. David was self-differentiated. He could sense this is wrong. You know, he could override that fear reaction with a moral, this is wrong reaction. Then, you know, talking more about self-trust. You know, when his brother tried to sow doubt or undermine him, he had trust in himself. I love David's reaction. It's basically quietly, not to his brother's face. He goes, sheesh, what's up with him? Hello. <laughs> He's looking for Goliath. Did you get a slingshot? He's not afraid. He is not afraid. Goodbye, Landon. Bob's over there. So self-trust. Self-trust at the battle line to have a different reaction to something. Self-trust when his brother, somebody he would look up to, have power over him, he's like, whatever. He didn't fall under that sway. Self-trust when Saul said, you're just a kid. I love the moment where he's like, I'm a warrior too. I'm a warrior in my own way. Wow, self-trust, healthy self-trust. I have skills that I've been given to use in this situation. And when Saul tries to project onto David, well, here's how you're going to do it, self-trust. David's like, I'm going to use my own toolkit that I've been given in this situation. So self-trust. Number two, so three trust. The first trust is healthy self-trust. The second trust is I'll call it cosmic trust, trust in God. 
So David wasn't fueled by, how do I expand my ego in this? How do I control and manipulate the situation? David had a healthy trust in a God of justice. God won't stand for this. God won't stand for disrespect or injustice. And for us, we believe in a God of love who cares about people who are oppressed. David has a marvelous sense of God trust. It's interesting when you listen to David's God language. And I was reminded of in 1 Samuel 16, right before this chapter, uh, it says the Spirit of God came powerfully upon David. So you wonder if this God trust helped David have self-trust, a healthy sense of courage, that uh, he knew who God was, he knew he, who he was. So he trusted in a God of justice and love. The third trust is situational trust. Trust in the situation. And I'd say situational trust is the belief that a situation can get better, that it's fixable. Self-trust, God trust, situational trust. I was picturing those three trusts as three circles, concentric circles. If you put all three of those circles together, inside is the shape of a smooth stone, a stone of faith. Faith helps us meet great odds. I was thinking as I looked at this story, you know, there's Goliath, and then there were Goliaths. You see, Goliath is dependent on fear taking root in others and creating mini Goliath, small g situations. Fear just mushrooms and goes on and on and on. The big G Goliath doesn't have to do much work when that energy gets taken on by others. 40 verses, 40 verses are about small Goliath situations of people being in fear. But when we have faith, when we have three trusts in the smooth stone of faith, it just takes one person being slung into a situation to make things better. You know, I was thinking each one of you has a resume. Particular ups and downs, failures, good stuff, things you do day in and day out. Those things make you a warrior in your own way. You, every single one of you, is a warrior. And your kit for that is very different, and God uses every single part of your life. So trust that. You're a warrior. And God, we can trust God. We believe in a God who comes from the cross and is nonviolent. I was thinking the cross is kind of like a slingshot. And in faith, the cross slings us, the stone of our lives, into situations that need lots of love. And we can do this. We may think, oh, this situation is far too big. And this story says there is nothing too big that cannot be addressed with the slingshot of faith. Let our church be a place where we practice and figure it out and form a habit for how we address situations in life, because they are addressable with practice and prayer and working together. To God be the glory. Amen. <laughs>